Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Welcome back to the Mowbray family. Hey, I hear a good report. You've had an exciting time. We have another family about to hit the road. The Zanoff family are about to go to Japan and catch up with family. Travel's good, isn't it? Travel's exciting. It's what life's about. But thank you to those who have come this morning to worship with us. Thank you for being in God's house to receive a blessing from our almighty Father. There is one family I'd just like to bring your attention. I had a phone call this morning from John Coronui. His wife, Felicity's mother, Maureen, has been taken to hospital and appears by all sounds to be quite critical. Um, yes, she was a little earlier on, only a month or so ago, diagnosed with cancer, but it now exceeds, it, it appears that there are major complications setting in, and they've headed there, and they would like the church family to pray on their behalf. So please remember all these families in need as you enjoy the blessings of life throughout the next week. Well, it's time once again when we come to celebrate communion. Where's our little clicker? Where's our little on the table there? Lovely. This morning I want to start off talking to you a little bit about trees. Trees. But before we do, let's just bow our heads. Loving Father, this is your time. And we thank you that you're sharing your time with us. We thank you for those who have made the sacrifice this morning of this time to you. And we pray that as we come into your presence to celebrate in the gifts you have given us a long time ago, we pray that this will be a joyful experience, a rich experience, and you will be the centre of it all. May our worship bring glory to your name, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to take you to a beautiful place. Paradise, wouldn't you say? Absolutely delightful Let's have a look at another. Oops, we've gone a little bit too far. There we are. Let's have a look at another. They're both pictures of a beautiful country. A country my ancestors call Eatearoa, a place of the long white cloud, a place of beauty, a place of variety, a place I called home for a while, but no longer now but it is still a significant place in my life. And of course, I thought I would not put you, not cause you to be miserable and put a picture of the All Blacks up there, but we are famous for the Kiwi, okay? New Zealand is its only home. It's a native to New Zealand, the brown Kiwi. And as I was searching the slides, my granddaughter saw this one, said, Pop, you have to put that up there. Nothing like a family is there. And uh, we are truly enjoying the moment while Leah is with us and little Charlotte is with us until they settle in their own home. But God is good and God blesses us with this abundant of variety of which we get to experience joy. But New Zealand is the home to a famous tree. Can anyone here give me the name of this tree? It's a cowrie, it's a cowrie, but it has a name. Can anyone give me its name? Tani, Tani Mahuta. Okay, it is the largest known tree in New Zealand. The Maori name Tani Mahuta means Lord of the Forest. If you had to stretch a tape, meter, tape measure around its trunk, you would need one that would extend for 45 feet or 13.77 metres. Its trunk height alone is 17.68 metres, 58 feet to the first branch. Its total height is higher than the Eiffel Tower. 
It scales 51.2 metres. Its trunk volume alone is 244 cubic metres. The total volume of the tree is 516 metres. An amazing tree, Tani Mahuta. Well respected and honoured by the Maori people of New Zealand. And yes, we pride ourselves as Kiwis in many things. And Tani Mahuta is special. But really, he's no special than any other tree. It's just that he's got to be there a long time. Some actually say that his seed germinated in the week of the birth of Christ. Some will date the tree back to 2,000 plus years. Others will say, ah, that's a stretch of the imagination. But the minimum, they say it's been there, is at least 1,500 years. So it's been around a long time. And he's been serving community for quite a long time because trees live to give. That's the essence of a tree. There is no other purpose of a tree other than to give. It lives for the purpose of giving and we know through photosynthesis and all of that that trees have a primary purpose in life. And if they were not there, our, the place we live would be very different and we would be struggling to survive. And so I'm bold enough to say that trees are essential for life. And just as the tree plays its part in life and assists our community, so we focus also on other elements that play an important part in our life. These are the three most essential elements, if you like, to a human being. Well, those of you in the know might say, well, where would we be without gravity? Where would we be without oxygen? And all of this other stuff. But I want to say without these three essential elements, we wouldn't be there to enjoy the others. And so we have these, these three essential elements. We have water that is vital to life, vital to our being, vital to our exist existence. We have the bread, which plays a significant part in our daily life. Without sustenance, we would struggle to exist. Without food, we would struggle to exist. And by using bread, I'm not saying that that's all you need, but that's how the Bible describes the need for sustenance, sustenance is it uses the illustration of bread. And of course, where would we be without blood? Yeah, when I googled blood, whew, that was a bit scary, the pictures that came up. And I thought, well, I can't, can't put those photos up there, those pictures up there, and I thought this was the most appropriate, just that, that drop of blood. But we know blood to be an essential element to, to our existence. It flows through all of us. It's special to all of us. It's our life. It's everything about us. Water is the symbol of cleansing. It's the symbol of cleansing from sin. Cleanliness is next to godliness. And so this is why when we celebrate the communion service, we find the connection of water with it. For to truly be able to experience the beautiful blessings of God, we need to be cleansed from that which separates us. So water, water, that which cleanses, is one of the the elements of our communion service. Blood, or bread, is the sustain, sustaining provider of life. 
And blood is the source of all life, spiritual and physical. Not only is blood essential to my own physical being, but blood is essential to my spiritual being, my spiritual wholeness. And just as these elements play a part in our life, so too does communion play a part in our whole Christian experience. There are three essential elements to our Christian experience. Communion is one of them. Communion is the place where we come to celebrate and praise God for the cleansing of sin in my life, your life, looking forward. So we come to the table, we come to the communion table in celebration for the cleansing of sin. This is where we get the reminder that we have been cleansed from sin. Connected to the communion service is a baptism service where there is that public expression of a person's joy in the Lord that they can bury the past and be raised up in the newness of life. And the third essential element, I believe, of the Christian experience is the Sabbath. This moment in time when we come together as a group of people to publicly express that the Lord is, that God, Jesus, is the Lord of my life today. And so, yes, we need water, we need blood, we need bread. We need communion, we need baptism, we need the Sabbath. When we open our Bibles to John chapter 13, we get Jesus washing the disciples' feet, cleansing the disciples, preparing them for their communion service, or in this case, the Passover becoming the communion. We come to this, this great event where Jesus takes the disciples aside and he washes their feet, something they had overlooked, something they did not care to do. They were caught up, they were distracted. And as Jesus goes through this, this process of washing the disciples' feet after the moment is over, he turns to them. And in verse 12, he says, So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? Do you know what I have done to you. I wonder how they reacted. I wonder what thoughts went through their minds. Well, what has he done? What is the significance of what he has done? And up until this point of time, up until Jesus does this beautiful thing, and until Jesus washes the disciples' feet and the tensions are washed away, nobody was able to appreciate what Jesus had done. As he washed, as he washed the feet of Peter, there was no peace in the air. There was chaos, there was, there was tension, there were issues. Peter first of all said to him in verse 8, you shall never wash my feet. Bit of a strong statement, isn't it? And Jesus responds with the same amount of energy. He meets Peter on equal terms. Oh Lord, you won't wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I do not wash your feet, you have no part of me. Verse 9, Simon Peter said, Lord, not just my feet then. If it's so important for you to do this, not just my feet, wash me all over. 
And Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he who knew who would betray him, therefore he said, You are not all clean. Yes, then he asked the question, Do you know what I have done? The most of the times when we go about washing, it's only for one reason. It's only to remove the dirt on the outside. And we can take care of that. We can have a shower as many times a day as we like to take care of it. Some people think they only need to bathe once a week. I, I knew a man that believed he only needed to bathe once a week. He never wanted to be with him for five days of the week, I know that. But yes, we can ourselves take care of the dirt on the outside. And when the disciples first engaged in the foot washing, that's all they thought it was about making a person welcome in their home, washing the dirt from the outside. But Jesus posed this question, do you really know what I have done? Jesus is stressing the point that he cleans on the inside, that he is able to clean up the inside and change our being on the inside and give us a new look at life. If we just continually remove the dirt from the outside and not from the inside, we're not going to be any different. And so it is today that we come together as a group of people to do what Jesus did. Use water not to cleanse the outside, but to help cleanse the inside. For as we participate in the service of humility, we are doing what Jesus did, serving one another. And we invite everyone to do that today. There is a facility set up for the woman straight to the rear of the church. Or is that, which is the woman? That's the men. <laughs> Look, I haven't been here long enough. And the ladies are down in the hall. So men out there, ladies down there, but as you enter both of those rooms, you will notice that there is a table also because some of our elderly are getting to the point where they're not able to kneel graciously and take care of each other, yet they want to wash and go through this ritual and process. So today there will be tables in both of those rooms with bowls on those tables and if you are unable to kneel and wash one another's feet, you are able to sit opposite each other at a table and you're able to wash one another's hands. So that's a service that we're making available to you today and you're most welcome to do it. But if you're able to follow the tradition of kneeling down and washing one another's feet, Please feel free to do so, but as I said, there will be that extra opportunity today to make sure that you are sharing in the blessing of washing one another as Jesus washed. Let us now separate as we go to the Lord's service of humility. But yes, just coming back to this thought of the tree for a moment, if you go to Genesis chapter 2, we are introduced to Adam and to the place of Adam's home. And in Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, we are told that Adam lived life in the presence of the tree. Verse 9 says, And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So there's the purpose of the trees, the general trees, every tree but one. And it says to Adam, every tree that grows is pleasant to the sight 
and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And if you come now down to chapter 3, verses 22 and 24, it says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil, and now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed a cherub at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Yes, Adam grew up in the presence of not just every tree, but two trees in particular. One was for his eternal existence. The fruit was for his sustenance. The leaves were for his healing. And while in the presence of that tree, he would live forever. But there was this other tree that he was told not to go near. And you know the story. Yes, temptation happened. They succumbed to the desire of the tree, the, the beauty of the tree and the serpent and everything else. And so sadly, because he took fruit from the forbidden he was forbidden from that which granted him life forevermore. And so Adam now is isolated from that tree of life. But when we move to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2, we're given these thoughts. In Revelation chapter 2 verse 7 it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him I who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So here in Revelation we're given a picture of the future. Whoever overcomes the issues of life, the problems of sin, surrender to the will of God, God says he will grant them the privilege of again eating from the tree of life, something we long for, something we wait for. And then if we go over to Revelation chapter 22, again we're given this beautiful picture of the tree of life. And notice what it says here in Revelation chapter 22 verse 2. We'll go to the next slide if you're looking for it. Revelation 22 verse 2, it says, In the middle of its street... And on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Beautiful, isn't it? These rich thoughts that are being brought to us from Scripture. Verse 14 of Revelation 22. Blessed are those who do His commandments, that they may have the right to, to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. That will be Adam's privilege in the future. His life began in the presence of the tree of life and his life will begin again in the presence of the tree of life. So if Adam lived in the presence of a tree in the beginning of time, for eternal existence and he will live out the rest of eternity in the presence of a tree for eternity, the tree of life. What about now? Notice I called the sermons three trees because as we study scripture, we're introduced to a third tree, the tree in the middle, the tree in the middle. And what is this third tree? What is this tree that is in the middle? We have some beautiful pictures of Jesus and this tree, the tree in the middle. Just as the tree of life was a gift of God, the tree in the middle is also a gift of God. Notice what it says in Acts chapter 13, verses 29 and 39. 
when it's talking about the place where Jesus was. Acts, beautiful little passage in scripture. Although it has this ugly component of a dying saviour, it introduces powerful thoughts to us. Acts 13, we monitor up the backs, not, not working today. Acts 13, verse 29. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. And then in verse 39, it says, And by him everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Through this Jesus, this Jesus that hung on a tree, this Jesus that died on a tree, that was taken off a tree, brings to us exactly the same as what the tree of life brought to Adam in the garden and brings us all in the earth made new. It is that tree that gives us eternal sustenance. Without Jesus dying on the tree, without Jesus dying on the cross, it would not be possible for us to overcome. It would not be possible. Earlier on I mentioned blood and what it does. Blood cleanses. 1 John 1, 7 says that blood cleanses. In Romans chapter 3, we're told that it's blood that justifies. In Ephesians chapter 2, we're told that it is blood that reconciles. In Ephesians chapter 1 and Colossians 1, 14, we're told that it is blood that redeems. In Hebrews 10, 29, we're told it is a blood that sanctifies. Yes, those essential elements that brings life and gives life to the human family is all found from the one who spilt his blood on the tree of Calvary. If we just consider the bread for a moment, bread signifies to us the acceptance of Jesus as the author and the finisher and the supporter of all life. Bread signifies to us that we receive Jesus as the heaven-sent teacher. Bread, when we take part in the sharing of the bread and the emblem of the bread, it is acknowledges the nearness of Jesus and our being. It acknowledges, it signifies that one may never thirst, hunger, never desire any higher good. This Jesus who died on a cross is all of this to you and me. When we take hold of the bread, we signify our willingness to exercise faith. When we take hold of the bread, we signify that we are willing to accept light, peace, hope, and joy. When we take hold of the bread, it signifies that we are wanting to strengthen the soul, both physical and spiritual. Could you imagine the pain on Adam and Eve as they were separated from the tree of life? the anguish that must have come upon them, the awe of the moment and what despair must have been, here life was being taken away. It's the same for us without Jesus. The issues that we face are enormous. But as we come to the Jesus that hung on the tree in the middle, we find our hope, we find our peace. As we take hold of the bread, we recognise that the study of scripture is a priority and we find our way to Jesus through all of these things. 
I just want to read a little statement to you. This actually comes out of the Bible Commentaries, page 989, but it is actually an extract from Manuscript 95, written in 1898. The sons of men have had a practical knowledge of evil, but Christ came to the world to show them that he had planted for them the tree of life, the leaves of which were for the healing of the nations. The leaves of the tree of life are pro-offered you. They are sweeter than honey and honeycomb. Take them, eat them, digest them, and your faint-heartedness will pass away. Christ was the tree of life to all who would pluck and eat. Let all bear in mind that the tree of life bears 12 manner of fruits. This represents the spiritual work of our earthly missions. The word of God is to us the tree of life. Every portion of the scriptures has its use and every part of the word is some lesson to be learned. Then learn how to study your Bibles. This book is not a heap of odds and ends. It is an educator. Your own thoughts must be called into exercise before you can really be benefited by Bible study. Spiritual sinew and muscle must be brought to bear upon the word the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance the words of Christ. He will enlighten the mind and guide the research. Christ is the tree of life. Christ is the source of our life, the source of immortality. He is the tree of life. And to all who comes to him, he gives spiritual life. Review and Herald, January 6th. 1890, 1897. So our prophetic inspired writer would have us to believe that like Adam, we live in the presence of the tree of life, Jesus, the great saviour, the great redeemer, the sacrifice of mankind, he is the tree of life. He brings to us an eternal existence because he died on a cross. His body was broken on the cross. His blood was spilt on the cross. And we can rejoice because of all that Christ has done. And I thank God that the time is coming when we will be reunited in the presence of of all life, the tree of life. So there's the quote from the Review and Herald, 1897. Could this be the tree of greatest importance? The tree on which Jesus died? Well, without it, we don't have life. We don't have eternal life. We don't have hope. And I believe because of that, it is most important. Without this tree, without the tree upon which Jesus died, we would not be able to enjoy the fruit of the tree in the new earth. I thank God that Jesus is the tree of life to everyone today. And so she says in page 659 of Desire of Ages, now as we move on to the Lord's Supper, we are not to stand in the shadow of the cross, but in its saving light. We are to open the soul to the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness. How privileged we are, how blessed we are that Christ is all of that to us. He himself said, if I be lifted up, just as Moses was lifted up 
the serpent in the wilderness, he said, so must I, the son of man, be lifted up. And that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Yes, Jesus was lifted up on a cruel, rugged tree. But from him, the world again gains life. What a beautiful thing that is. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 26, we come now to the table of the Lord and we would ask our deaconesses to come forward and to uncover the table for us, please. So yes, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23, we have it as where Paul is gathered with a group of believers and he's encouraging them in faithfulness and spiritual worship and he brings them to this place. He brings them to a table, a table which has the emblems of the cross the emblems of the life-giving tree. And we're going to ask Laura if she would offer the prayer of blessing upon, here we are, she's getting a mic, a prayer of blessing upon the broken body of Christ. Thank you. If you're wanting to kneel, you're most welcome. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much that we don't have to come here today sorrowful for our past, for our failings, but that we can rejoice in what Jesus' broken body has done for us. And we ask your blessing on the emblems of Christ's body today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Scripture reads, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We'll Please. ask our elder to say the prayer on the blood. Thank you. For those that are able to kneel, please feel free to do so if you wish. Our loving Father in heaven, we do thank you so much that you have provided emblems rather than real sheep anymore for us to slaughter. We're so grateful we're into a, a new covenant as you have, as you have given us. And in this part, Lord, as we partake of the wine, that is the emblem of your blood. Again, we are so grateful, so thankful that you did this for us. As we drink it, Lord, may we, may we remember, may we be humbled, may we forever hold on to the promise, knowing that you are soon coming and the next time we drink it, we will drink it with you in heaven and we praise you and thank you jesus in your name amen scripture continues in the same manner 
he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do also as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Ponder this thought as the music plays and as they come to gather your, your cup. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Scripture gives us this picture that the thing we're to focus on as we live life is that moment that Jesus died on a cross, died on a tree. And just as every tree you see with its branches and leaves gives life to humanity and supports life, so too from that tree, that ugly tree in Golgotha, comes life to every one of us. For Jesus demonstrated through his broken body that he was willingness to sacrifice for what was truth and right and the only thing to do. And through that, we can live in peace and joy and hope today. But the day is coming when we'll all be celebrating life for eternity because of Jesus. Thank you to our deacons, our deaconesses. Thank you to our musicians. It's been sweet to hear that music. We do have a hymn to sing now, This Is My Desire. And we'll ask you all to stand together as we sing this song. As it commences, we'll have our deaconesses come and cover the table. Thank you, ladies. Loving Lord, many of my ancestors in the land of Aotearoa are proud to acknowledge Tani Mahuta, Lord of the forest. But we thank you today, Jesus, that you are greater than he, that you are greater than all trees and all living specimens, that you yourself are the only one that can truly be called Lord but he can also be called Saviour of all. And I thank you today that he is truly our Saviour, that from him we gain life and all the blessings that the tree of life gave to Adam and Eve in the beginning, Jesus extends to us today. And I just pray that we will reach out to that Jesus, that he will become the Lord of all in our lives so that the day will come when together we will be able to walk up to the tree of life and the new earth and harvest its fruit and its leaves and forever live in your presence. Thank you, Jesus.
for being the Lord of all. Amen.